Over the past couple of decades, there have been many changes made towards the horror game formula, with many of them being pretty good and some leaving you with a foul taste in your mouth. But today we aren't talking about a game that is good or bad. Instead, we are taking a deep dive into a horror game that has drastically changed how we view horror games as we see today. A game that has revolutionized what a game can truly do to terrify you. This game isn't good, it's a masterpiece. And this masterpiece is called Amnesia The Dark Descent. Now, from this game alone, most of you have probably seen it or at least heard of it before. Amnesia was insanely innovative for its time. It showed everyone what a horror game could be and what a truly terrifying experience could look like. Today we're going to look at where horror games were before Amnesia and what impact Amnesia has left in its path. Along with this, I'll also be talking about the story and the gameplay describing why this game works so well and how it was so innovative for its time. With that said, get yourself some popcorn and get comfy because today we're getting right into the deep dark layer of Amnesia. So in order for us to really understand how Amnesia has innovated the horror formula, we first have to look back at what the norm was for horror games back then. In the early 2000s, there were a decent amount of well-made horror games ranging from AA to AAA games. One of the very first games being Silent Hill 2 developed by Konami in 2001. In this game, you play as James who has been invited by his deceased wife to return to a town called Silent Hill. When he arrives, he finds that the town is covered in fog and disturbing creatures. This atmosphere of the mysterious town covered in mist creates a lot of uneasiness in the player, enhancing the jump scares in the game. Along with this, you had creepy enemies that could attack you at any moment, and the combat in the game was deliberately clunky to make the player feel helpless. This helpless feeling was also replicated in Fatal Frame 2 made by Tecmo in 2003. This game takes place in a creepy abandoned village where two sisters become trapped and must unravel the mysteries of the village's past to escape. The setting of this game creates a lot of tension and the use of the camera was very unnerving. The only way you could defend yourself was through the camera. You had to get close and personal with the ghosts and capture them in order to survive. Along with this, when using the camera, it restricted your view creating a feeling of being claustrophobic. Overall, Fader Frame 2 was heavily focused on atmosphere and the use of the camera to capture ghosts. Fast forwarding to 2005, Capcom created a game called Resident Evil 4. In this game, you played as Leon, a government agent who is sent to a rural village to rescue the president's daughter from a crazy cult. The game had pretty advanced third-person combat for the time and enhanced the gameplay, making the combat more intense. The use of atmosphere and the horrifying cult members you came across enhanced that feeling of dread. Overall, this game had a good balance between intense moments of combat and downtime to regain that tension back between the player. So based on what we already looked at here, you'll realize horror games in the early 2000s were heavily focused on the use of intense action sequences and their creepy use of atmosphere. It's a good formula to keep the player in a vicious cycle of releasing tension during the action scenes and gaining it back during the down parts of the game. Another thing you'll also notice is that the majority of horror games had some form of combat. You always had some way to defend yourself from enemies. Fear developed by Monolith Productions released in 2005 was a first person shooter where you played as a special team called Fear, fighting off some kind of paranormal entity. And lastly, Dead Space, developed in 2008 by EA Redwood Shores, now known as Visceral Games, was a third person shooter where you play as Isaac who must defend himself from horrifying humanoid monsters to escape the ship. So as you see, the formula for horror games in the early 2000s was balanced combat that gave players just enough to defend themselves and the use of well-crafted atmosphere through the storytelling, sound, lighting, and environments. This formula was proven to work and was seen as what to expect from horror games back then. That was, until Amnesia showed up. In 2010, Frictional Games decided to try something different, by getting rid of the ability to defend yourself altogether by creating a game called Amnesia The Dark Descent, where the only thing you can do is run and hide. The game was made with the atmosphere being the foundation, and the action being secondary. This horror formula was super new for the time and was never done to this level before. But as we all know, sometimes new innovations don't always mean they're good. Sometimes the concept just isn't fledged out enough. So that begs the question, how did Amnesia grasp this new understanding of what horror games can be and why does it work so damn well? Well, in order to understand this, we first have to look at the story and the gameplay. 
so I decided to take some time to play through the game while taking notes as to why this game works so well and why it was so innovative for its time. With that said, before I get into this game's story and gameplay, I highly, highly advise playing this game for yourself before watching the rest of this video. It's a huge staple when it comes to horror games and is something every horror game fan should experience at least once. So please, if you haven't played this game, definitely give it a try because I'll be going over many spoilers. With that said, let's get right into it. Don't forget, some things mustn't be forgotten. The shadow hunting me. I must hurry. So the game starts you off in a cutscene of the perspective of Daniel. He seems to be in a daze walking through some kind of medieval castle. And as he continues walking, he talks to himself, seeming to try and not forget who he is and what he was doing. Daniel ends up crashing on the floor and blacking out. And this is when the game starts, with you waking up in some part of the castle. Getting up, you notice a liquor trail, so you decide to follow it, and as you're walking through the castle following the trail, you'll hear tons of different sounds, ranging from footsteps, screaming, creaking in the castle, and sometimes a loud roaring noise from afar. All these sounds do an amazing job at setting the mood of this castle, giving you a feeling of dread and anguish. As you continue, the game quickly shows you that you can pick up items and freely rotate them, as well as opening closets and doors. This mechanic of the game has a huge impact on how you play, because you'll use it for puzzles and use it to hide from monsters. It's also used in clever ways to enhance the scary parts of the game. As you continue on, a door opens in front of you, and going into this room, there are a couple of old paintings on the stone walls. As you explore the room a little, a huge gust of wind extinguishes the candles in the room, which was the only source of light you had. This is when the game introduces you to your sanity meter. In your inventory, you have a picture of your brain that indicates how your sanity is doing. Your sanity can be decreased by looking at enemies or staying in dark areas for too long, making your vision hazy and blurry. And if your sanity continues to decrease reaching zero, you end up blacking out in the game. This game mechanic was such a smart idea because it forces the player to act appropriately as if this was real. It also adds an extra layer to the gameplay and prevents you from looking at the monster too much, keeping the vagueness of the enemies intact allowing your imagination to take over. Going back to the game, you use the tinder boxes you've been finding to light the candles again to save your sanity and continue forward. You end up coming across a door that leads to the old archives, and going in, you come across a room that has an old lantern and decide to take it with you. Looking at your inventory, you realize you have to use the lantern sparingly because it slowly drains of oil. You can find fuel for the lantern scattered around the environments in the game, but they don't come by often. As Daniel keeps going forward, the castle periodically shakes, seeming to be unstable. And once you reach the end of the liquor trail, you come across a table with a note. Getting closer, you realize it's written by yourself, Daniel. He goes on talking about how he had drank a potion, choosing to forget. He talks about what you have to do to put things right. You find out he wants you to go into the inner sanctum and kill Alexander of Brennenberg. You also find out there is a shadow following you, breaking down reality. There isn't any way to fight it, so you have to escape it for as long as you can. As you can see, this game makes your goals vague, and deliberately makes the enemies vague as well. I think this was done to let your imagination take hold and make the enemies scarier than it really is. This is done in a lot of horror movies and games today. Nothing is scarier than your own imagination. Back to the game, after reading the note, you notice a lever sticking out of one of the walls. Pulling it down, a hidden passage opens up to you, and going in, you find that the door leads to an entrance hall. And once you make it through, you start to get an idea of just how bad of a state this castle is in. Pillars have collapsed, damaged ceilings and floors. It's as if this castle is falling in on itself. Going towards the middle stairway, you get a flashback and recall a memory of Daniel talking to the Baron, who is Alexander. It seems they have to go down below the castle of Brennenberg in order to do their business. The flashback ends and you decide to see what's behind the door in the stairway. Going into the room, you encounter some weird red tissue blocking your way. Later in the game from notes, you find out it's part of the shadow. You have to dissolve it somehow in order to get to the refinery, so you go exploring looking for a way to get rid of this mysterious tissue. As you explore, you come across two doors on the left side of the entrance hall. One leads to the laboratory and the other leads to the wine cellar. Going into the laboratory first, you come across a room filled with potions and bottles. In the middle of this room, you notice some weird creature in the water. As you look around some more, you come across two notes, both of them giving you clues as to what ingredients you need in order to make a highly acidic substance and where to find them. You figure out all the ingredients are located in the winer cell, so you head to the entrance. But when you try to enter, you find out it's locked and have to find a key. 
So you decide to look around some more and find a door that leads to the archives. And going in, you come across notes from Daniel talking about an expedition he went on in Africa looking for a tomb. Finding the tomb, he went in and had his team help him get past the blocked pathway. When he got through, his only exit got blocked, sealing him in the room. And exploring a little more, you get a flashback and find out Daniel came across a mysterious glowing blue orb in this room. When he grasped it in his hands, he gained alien memories of some kind of other world. After this, the Arabs pulled him to safety outside the tomb, with Daniel now having the broken pieces of the orb. As you continue looking around the archives, you get another flashback with Daniel and Alexander. But this time, they are talking about making the castle more structurally sound because of the shadow that is following Daniel. The shadow could cause the whole castle to collapse, so Alexander made plans to have his servants reinforce weak structures. After the flashback, you find another secret passage and find the key to the wine cellar. After picking up the key, you hear a loud bang from someone or something. And as you make your way back, you catch a glimpse of a horrifying creature. Carefully, you head in the same direction and make it back to the entrance hallway. When entering, the shadows appear in front of you, hurting you as you step over it. You continue to make your way to the wine cellar and enter through the door. And when in the wine cellar, you hear all kinds of noises. You hear cries of children, steps from afar, and noises of the castle. It's as if there is a presence in this room. You continue looking around for the ingredients and get startled by a loud gurgling roar. You look over your shoulder and realize something dangerous is close. You hide till it passes you and continue forward, more worried than before. As you explore a little more, you come across a room covered in blood. You find out through a flashback and a note that Alexander poisoned a bunch of his servants with some substance and locked them in a cell. Something horrific happened to the men, based on the note William's last words. He talks about how his men are screaming. Their skin has been pierced by their own tangled bones. This could be the creature that we have come across in the wine cellar. I love that this doesn't give the player a clear answer on whether this note is correlated to the monster you came across. It continues to be vague and actually makes the monster scarier because now you have an assumption that it used to be human and now it's something mangled and horrific. Back to the game, once you find all the ingredients, you head back to the laboratory and create the acidic substance. Once created, you head back to the hall entrance and notice the shadow has spread it even farther. You quickly enter back down the stairway and pour the acid on the tissue, blocking the path. After it dissolves, you enter the door to the refinery, and when entering, you gain another flashback of a conversation between Daniel and Alexander, with Daniel asking why it's so dark down here. Alexander doesn't give him an answer and just tells him there's a good reason for it and to stay close and not stray. I like the way this is brought up. It's another scenario where the situation is vague and makes the player more worried and tense because based on Alexander's response, there is something dangerous down here. It also tells the player the darkness is to hide from whatever may be down there with them. It's a really genius way of storytelling because it tells the story while also creating more fear in the player. It gets even better because when the flashback is over, you come across an opening and hear a loud roar and see a creature walking from afar. It's a really good setup for the silent jump scare and even manages to keep the tension because now you have to tread carefully to not get caught by this thing. Back to the game, you hesitantly continue forward, experiencing loud murmurs and talking from random areas. You come across more of the shadow, lingering in corners of the rooms. As you keep going, you find a little cross space to get into a room that has been locked. And when entering, you find a trap door that can be lifted up by a pulley system. But first, you find out you have to get rid of a stick jamming the pulley and use the mechanism to lift the trap door. Once you finally get it open, you go through it and find it leads to the cellar archives. In this room, you realize it's flooded with murky water. You hear some creature splashing towards you, and thinking on your feet, you quickly get on top of the floating boxes and watch as this mysterious monster gets closer to you. And just as quickly as it started, it stops. Staying clear of the dangerous monster, you jump from box to box and come across the lever in a room that lifts the door for a period of time. You pull the lever and make a mad dash to the door as the creature chases you, closely behind. You barely make it through and the monster chasing you gets stuck on the other side of the door. After that encounter, you realize you're in another room that has more of these creatures. And the only way to get through this room is to move the boxes in such a way that you can make it to the door and turn the valve. Once you turn the valve, you head into a room with a locked door. And looking around, you manage to find a needle which you end up using to unlock the door to the archive tunnels. Going through, you finally catch your breath and continue forward thinking the ordeal is over. But all of a sudden, you hear the creature charging towards you. With nothing to jump on for safety, you run as fast as you can and just barely make it to the black hall. 
Now, this was such an amazing chase sequence. It has everything that makes Amnesia so terrifying. The buildup was smartly done. The game first introduces you to the creature by giving you an idea of what to expect. The game also shows you how you can avoid these creatures, giving you areas to stand on for safety. And once you get comfortable with this new game mechanic, it then takes the only thing that makes you feel safe, the boxes, and forces you to run in the murky water without any knowledge of what's ahead. You don't have time to think because this creature is coming at you, and fast. And along with this, the panic begins to set in, and is only worsened when you have to manually open the doors. This is a moment in the game when the mechanic to be able to open the doors with your mouse is used to enhance the game, making it more terrifying because you have to meticulously open all these doors yourself, making you stop to open them, creating more tension because you know every second you waste is every second it gets closer to killing you. The sound design even complements this feeling of panic, hearing the loud roars of the monster and the quick relenting banging getting louder as you continue forward. It's so well done, and this moment here was something never seen in a horror game before. It was so unique because it isn't how the monster looks that scary, it's your imagination that makes it so terrifying. The game allows you to imagine what this horrifying thing could be by showing its strength and allowing you to hear the sounds it makes basically everything except being able to actually see it. It's also very different from other games in the 2000s, because you aren't even given a weapon to defend yourself, you are merely only given a way to run and hide from it. Back to the game, after being chased you make it to the back hall and go up the stairs. You come across a weird creepy fountain that seems to have a child's head at the top with its neck bony and elongated. You head to the left of it and find the room has an elevator. While heading towards it, you get a flashback of Alexander describing that the elevator leads to the inner sanctum. After this flashback, you try to use the elevator to no avail. It seems to not be in working order, so you go exploring to find out what the problem is. As you continue exploring, you come across a machine room, but it's locked shut, so you have to go find a key. You head back to the main hall and go up the stairs into the study. And when you enter, you come across a disturbing room with taxidermy scattered around, seeming to be some kind of study of animals. While walking around the room, you get a quick flashback of Alexander killing an animal, sounding like he is looking for something specific within it. Going into the other room attached to it, you find human skulls and bones in one of the drawers of the desks, pushing the notion that Alexander might have been killing humans for his studies too. In this room, you also come across a note that talks about how Alexander is trying to understand the inner workings of life and its relation to the power he senses within it. He continues going on that humans emanate more energy than animals. There's also another note written by Alexander with him talking about how causing stress within living beings creates more energy. He believes he can capture that energy, but needs to find a way to torture his victims more than once to make the process of collecting energy more efficient. After reading the note, you head back out the room and find out one of the windows is very weak. You go back into the room and grab a chair and throw it against the window, causing it to shatter in on itself. You go to the ledge and make your way to a different section of the castle. While you're jumping from ledge to ledge, you'll also see that the shadow has spread over the outside environment, covering the trees and rocks. I really like that the game allows you to see a little of what it's like outside the building, and I like it even more that it shows you that it isn't much better outside than it is inside the castle. It shows the player there isn't much of a point to escape in the building, because it wouldn't solve the problem at hand, which is the shadow. After you make it to the other section, you come across a note giving you instructions on what to do if the elevator breaks down. Along with this, you find a flow cycle rod that goes to the machine room. Heading back to the back hall, you go to the guest room where Daniel used to sleep at. Going in, you get a flashback of Daniel looking everywhere for his journal, with him wondering what they wanted from it. He continues to explore the messy room and finds a crowbar in the bedroom. Next to the bed, you also find a note describing how Daniel's professor, Herbert, went into the tombs and found and retrieved the orb, but this confuses Daniel because he had pieces of the orb in his drawing room. After reading the note, you go to the last door and use the crowbar to pry the door open. When entering the room, you get a flashback and remember that there is an important key hidden within this room. Looking around for a bit, you find the key behind a painting on the wall. It turns out this key unlocks the door to the machinery room. Along with this, you also find a note by Daniel describing how he suddenly knew how the shards of the orb were meant to be placed. He grabbed the tar and joined the shards together, producing the orb he remembered so clearly. It is also interesting to note that he describes that the tar wasn't needed and that it was pushed out from the adjoining pieces and that they merged on their own with no adhesive. After you're done looking around, music starts playing and you hear a monster barge in. Thinking quickly, you hide in one of the closets till the monster left the room entirely. 
I loved how they set this up. The game waits a bit before having anything happen to allow the player to build up suspense again, and I liked that it allowed you to understand as a player that you can hide in the closets by opening them and closing them while you're in it. Not only does this make you more tense, but now you have no idea when this monster will appear next. After this appearance, I felt I had to be more careful here on out, and I felt more alert because of this. Back to the game, after the monster left, you exit the guest room and head to the right of the back hall, going into the storage. When you get into the storage room, Daniel describes that the darkness feels strange and unnatural. Heading towards the machine parts, you get a flashback of a girl pleading to let her go, insinuating that Daniel was going to kill her in the storage room. After this, it's also interesting to take note that you can hear the same girl crying while you're in the storage room, as if her presence is still there. It's really creepy, and the first couple of times you feel like you might be in danger because you aren't really told if this crying girl is dangerous or not. Continuing on, you find that the path is blocked by rubble, and you need to find a way through it. Going to a different part of the storage, you find a note describing that there are liquids in the barrels that you can use to make an explosive. You just have to mix the two together to make it. After you find this out, you head over to a small area within the storage and find a drill. When grabbing it, you hear the monster again. Hiding, you wait for the right time to sneak past it. Heading back to the barrels, you look for the last part of the hand drill and find it behind a bunch of boxes. Going into your inventory, you put all the pieces together and use it on the barrels to drain each liquid into the container you have to create the explosive mixture. You go back to the block pathway and blow it up, creating a pathway for you to continue on forward. While doing so, you experience another flashback of the grill again, asking Daniel why you're doing this. Towards the end of the flashback, Daniel finally kills her, most likely through stabbing her to death. Once the flashback ends, you come across a closet and find the rest of the flow rods for the machine room. After picking them up, the horrifying monster comes back, forcing you to hide behind the old crate. You wait in anticipation, hoping to not be seen by this thing. Thankfully, it walks away. You follow behind it for it's the only way to go out of the storage room. After making it back to where the rubble was, this is when I first got spotted by the hideous monster. And when I say it was terrifying, it was absolutely horrific. The sounds that play when being chased by this thing is on another level. It's one of the most iconic sounds when it comes to horror games. It reminds me a lot of what alarms or sirens sound like in real life. And based on that connection alone, I can fully understand why it works so well. It mimics the same sounds you'd hear during lockdowns or a fire drill. It's meant to grab your attention and warn you something dangerous is happening, and that if you can, exit the area as efficiently as possible because if you don't, your life could be at stake. It's something that has been ingrained into our subconsciousness for most players, and to have this relatable sound translated into the game is just simply genius. When you hear it, you know you're in danger and you know something is chasing you. That's why, when I first encountered this, I totally lost my shit. I was in full on panic mode trying to get around this horrifying thing to be able to get to the exit. <laughs> and I can fully say, i have never been so relieved to see a door before. Anyway, after you exit the storage area, you head back to the machinery room and use the key you got from the guest room to unlock the door. When entering through the door, you'll find that there are pipes scattered everywhere around the rooms. Going into the first room, you find a note written by Daniel describing how he thinks that he might be the cause for William Smith's death, a man Daniel had asked for his expertise on the orb he found. In this room, there are also levers, and by solving it, it releases the water pressure, causing the pipes to start making noise. You continue heading down farther into the machine room and come across a device that has three different shaped holes. You end up putting all the flow rods you found while exploring into the holes, allowing the steam to continue down the pipes. You also come across another letter by Daniel in which he describes that Alexander sent him a letter telling him he knows about the orb and that he can protect him by coming to the Brennenburg castle. Daniel also goes on talking about how he's been having horrible nightmares and that it's gotten so bad that he has to go to a physician, Dr. Tate, in hopes that he can provide him with sedatives to help him sleep. After reading the note, you make it all the way to the bottom of the machine room where you find one last letter from Daniel, describing how everyone he has come close to have been horribly killed. Daniel feels the orb he had taken from Africa has something to do with it. He fears something is after him, and at the end of the note, he makes a last ditch effort by going to the Brennenburg Castle to get help from Alexander. Now, down in this room with the last letter, you find that there are missing cogwheels in the machine. 
so they go looking for spare cogwheels and place them on the machine's pegs. After setting them in place, she put fuel into the machine and it finally turns on. And after turning on the machine, the castle shakes and you hear loud roaring noises from afar. As this happens, the black shadow appears covering all the machinery and pipes as you make your way towards the exit. Barely escaping the shadow, you get to the elevator and make your way down. But as the elevator makes its way, it gets clogged by the shadow and then suddenly breaks causing you to fall down with great force. When getting up, you experience a flashback of a conversation between Alexander and Daniel. Alexander warns that this part of the castle is where he holds criminals and cells. He goes on explaining as Baron he also has the same responsibilities of a prison warden. And after the flashback ends, you enter the cellar-like door. Following the path, you hear a huge crash along with a loud humming noise from some creature. And along with this, you overhear someone in a cell screaming no. After a while, the noises stop, leaving you wondering what this new monster is. You continue on forward and find pathways going in different directions. Exploring a little bit, you find a hammer and come across a locked door. From behind the door, you hear the same humming-like noise, but this time you can just barely see the head of this creature. And one thing I really like that the game does is how it introduces monsters. If you haven't noticed, when the game introduces you to a new monster, it slowly drip feeds you information about them. Usually, you'll first hear the sounds it makes and read about it in some notes. Then you'll start catching small glimpses of it. And after this, the game finally lets you have the ability to be chased down by these monsters. It's really effective because it raises up the tension in the player, leaving you to wonder what this creature is. And when the final reveal happens, it's all the more terrifying because of the experiences leading up to it. It wouldn't be so effective if the game just quickly had the monster start chasing you. Instead, the game teases you with the notion that there will be something new and horrifying coming after you soon. You just don't know when or how it's going to come after you. Back to the game, you continue to explore more and go into a cellar and find a huge nail. After finding the nail, you get a flashback of Daniel interrogating a prisoner, who is a mom, asking where her daughter has escaped to. After this flashback, you continue on and come across a weak door lock and use the hammer and nail to break through. In the cellar, you find oil to fuel your lantern again, and now that you have fuel in your lantern, you continue forward, but the monster you've seen earlier in the game appears close behind you. Acting quickly, you hide and wait for it to pass you. And after it passes, you find yourself at another cellar, but get another flashback that depicts a conversation of a mother telling her child to go into the hole they dug out and tell Gabriel to alert the king's men. The flashback ends with mom hurrying the kid into the hole and hiding it using the bed. After learning about this information, you move the bed and there it is, a hole large enough to fit a child through. I really like this use of integral storytelling. These flashbacks have a meaning to them and have a reason to exist in the game. They either enhance the feel of what you're currently going through in the game, or they point you in the right direction by giving you subtle clues. The game doesn't treat you like you don't know how to do anything. The game knows you can put two and two together, and when you do it, it becomes really satisfying like in this moment right here. Anyways, after you discover the hole, you make it big enough for you to get through by using the nail and hammer. And going through, you find yourself in the northern block of the prison. You decide to follow the signs that lead to the storage area. And looking around, you end up coming across the new monster introduced earlier at the entrance of the prison. Only this time, you can see more of its disturbing figure. First thing you notice is its split open head and its metal blades for arms. You decide to take cover in a cell and notice there is a note written by Daniel describing his experience going into Brennenburg Castle. Continuing, you find another note with Daniel talking more about how grand the castle is and how Alexander wasn't as outwardly as you presumed. Going back out the way you came in, you hear the monster again, and hide and decide to be more careful while exploring the prison cell from here on out. Exploring some more, you come across the storage room and manage to grab a glass jar for later use. You then decide to sneak past the monster and head towards the kitchen area, where you find a note by Daniel talking about what Daniel learns from Alexander about the orb. Apparently, the orb casts a long and dark shadow. It's not only powerful, but super dangerous. By just simply touching it, you invoke the power from within it. But if you are too weak to control it, it will slowly devour you. Thankfully, the shadow isn't fast and is quite slow, lagging behind the wielder, killing anyone or thing in its path to reclaim the orb. Alexander tells Daniel he can protect him, which leads Daniel to question him, asking how. Alexander eerily replies with, things can be done, but at a price. 
I think it's almost important to mention that this is why all the people Daniel went to see about the orb died a couple days after. It's because the shadow is following his trail and killing anyone in his path. After you read the note, you come across a barrel of acid. You end up using the jar to safely carry the acidic liquids with you. But as you do so, you hear the monster trying to break into the kitchen area. You hide and hear it break through the door and walk inside. After it wanders a little, it exits the way it came, leaving you petrified. Reluctantly, you exit and use the acid to weaken a lock on an old door. After putting the acid over the lock, you use the hammer and nail to finally break it open. And after opening the door, the monster appears from behind you and starts chasing you down. You make a mad dash and enter the entrance of the cistern. And after entering, you get a flashback with Alexander describing how he uses the drain sewers as a way of transport. Looking around, you find yourself in a huge sewer area with the stairway down being blocked by water, forcing you to figure out how to drain the water from the stairway. You come across a ladder, but it's blocked by a pipe. And next to it, there is also a lever, but it needs oil. But luckily, not too far, you find a pipe that is leaking oil and decide to use the glass jar to collect it and pour it over the lever. After doing so, you pull the lever, causing the ladder to bend the pipe underneath it. And going up, you find a door that leads to the control room. In this room, you must solve a series of puzzles where you must match the left side to its similar counterparts on the right side of the rooms. During this part of the game, I came to appreciate the difficulty of the levels. They aren't too hard, but they also aren't too easy. It's a good balance and I think it helps to prevent the player from staying in one area for too long, which can drastically decrease how scared a player is in parts of a game. After you complete the series of puzzles, you manage to get the control room up and running, giving you the ability to control the bridges that give access to different rooms. You make your way back out and use a lever on the right to bring down a passage to the cistern. And entering the cistern, you find the floor is covered in water with pathways elevated leading to valves which control the water drainage. Making your way to the first valve, you witness a splash in the water, the same splash you experienced earlier in the game from that horrifying water monster. I love that the game teases this to the player. It makes you dread getting in the water to get to the next valve. It plays with your head, making you think that you're going to be chased by these creatures again, when, in reality, nothing actually happens in the cistern. It just goes to show how impactful having suspense in a horror game is because without it, during these parts of the game, it would feel boring and dragged out because nothing is happening. But since the game reminds you of what happened in the water last time, it causes you to wonder if the water is really safe in this room. It's so good and it shows fictional games really knew what they were doing and what they wanted the player to feel during each part of the game. Going back to the game, you find a note on the valve describing how Alexander puts a lot of faith in what Daniel sees as magic. It also talks about how Alexander woke Daniel up to head downstairs to the old dungeon to attempt his rituals. After reading the note, you head over to the second valve and turn it off. And just like the first valve, there is a note by Daniel describing Alexander has succeeded in channeling the orb's power onto themselves. He goes on saying that the room flared with blue fiery lights and that he had the same feeling when he discovered the tomb in Algeria. But unfortunately, the blue light was stained by strains of red and the walls burst with pulsating tissue. Before it got worse, Alexander covered the orb in some cloth. And after reading the note, you head over to the last valve, but you find that the path is blocked by a bridge, held up by chains. You decide to throw a rock at the chains, causing the bridge to fall down. And heading over to the last valve, you come across another note written by Daniel. And in this note, Daniel questions why Alexander is so worked up over the orb. Daniel ponders what Alexander stands to gain from this whole ordeal. After reading the note, you turn the last valve, causing the water in the stairs to drain. But there is one problem. The stairs is covered in poisonous gas and can only be walked in if you had the vaccine. So you decide to go into the other room on the right in the hopes of finding vaccines for the poisonous gas. Pulling the left lever, you find that the left bridge is stuck. And to fix it, you grab a rock and throw it onto the bridge, adding more weight onto it. And after a while, it finally lowers all the way down, allowing you to cross. And after crossing the bridge, you find it leads to the morgue. And when entering this morgue, you gain a flashback of Alexander telling Daniel that he did well and slowed down the shadow for the time being. It seems Daniel had to sacrifice someone because they have to go to the morgue. Plus, Daniel asks Alexander if there will be more dead men, insinuating that he has already seen a dead man. After the flashback, you enter a room that has a deceased man on the table. And as you continue to look around, you hear Alexander talking to you somehow, asking how you're doing. Daniel doesn't respond and stays silent. 
and later you find a note with Alexander fearing for Daniel because he is too tainted by the shadow to pass the gate. He asks himself if he'll be able to accept this. This leads Alexander deciding to keep it to himself and not tell Daniel. As you continue exploring, you find a copper tube that can be combined with the needle you still have to create a syringe. You decide to use the hand drill to create an opening in the still fresh dead body and insert the syringe you made into it to collect the blood. After this, you stick the syringe into yourself, allowing you to be vaccinated for the poisonous gas. After getting the vaccine, you try to head back down, but you hear the humming noise again and realize this new monster is breaking down the door. You quickly hide and wait for an opening to sneak behind it, and just barely making it, you escape and head downstairs, entering the sewer. Now, something I really like is that throughout the whole game, you're constantly descending below the castle. It might not be something you inherently notice while playing, but subconsciously, you sense how far down you are. I like this design choice for the level designs because it makes you feel farther from reality as you keep descending. The normalities of life feel so far out of reach, and at this point in the game, the only way you can really go is down due to the nature of this game. It brings you this feeling of isolation from the world. Back to the game, when entering the sewer, you find yourself in the water again, with some kind of water wheel contraption up ahead. Walking towards it, you hear the humming noise again and see this new monster walk past the water contraption. Being more alert now, you slowly continue forward, and when you get closer to the water wheel, you get a flashback of a man pleading to not take him somewhere, explaining that no one ever returns from there. After this flashback, you figure you have to find a way to stop the water wheel in order to get through onto the other side, so you go exploring the sewers. You decide to head left first and end up finding a room that controls the speed of the water wheel. Solving the puzzle, you manage to make the water wheel go slower than it was before. After solving this puzzle, you try to go back the way you came, but the monster appears in front of you, forcing you to hide and wait for it to pass. After it leaves, you continue on going back. Heading to the water wheel, you realize it's still too fast and that you need something to stop it from spinning. You head to the pathway on the right and end up finding an iron pipe. Heading back, you use the pipe to clog the water wheel, allowing you to crawl through. Continuing on forward, you come across a room that is covered in the shadow, and you find one of the monsters that have been chasing you since the beginning of the game is now decapitated, most likely by the shadow. After looking at the monster, you hear Alexander speak to you again, telling you to go back because you're leading the shadow with you. Heading back out the room, you hear a long bang and encounter the monster again. Quickly, you hide from it and continue exploring the rest of the sewers. You manage to find a ladder that takes you out of the sewers, but while making your way there, the monster chases you closely behind. Running as fast as you can, you just barely make it to the ladder, preventing you from getting shredded by the horrid thing. When you finally make it out the ladder, you realize you came out of an old well, and looking around, there are four doors to explore, with one leading you to a room with some kind of contraption with two levers, and the other door leading to a staircase heading down. The rest of the doors are locked. In the room with the contraption, you find a note written by Daniel, with him talking about the ritual he had to perform. Apparently, he had to kill a man in order to give him more time to fend off the shadow. In this note, Daniel seems to be pretty traumatized by the ordeal. Also, playing with the lever, you realize they aren't working, and figure the machine needs to be fixed somehow. You decide to go exploring down the staircase and enter another flashback of Alexander doing something to some man named Agrippa. Entering the room on your right, you come across a man that is in terrible condition. He tells you to pull the switch on the contraption next to you. In doing so, it seems to allow him to freely talk to you with ease through this contraption. You find out through talking to him that his name is Agrippa, and find out you need an orb in order to get to the inner sanctum where Alexander is. Agrippa tells you that you can find six shards in total at the transept and the choir, but before you head off, he asks you a favor. He wants you to create a potion that will allow him to be freed. You agree, and continue exploring and find a trapdoor to the machine that is broken. You manage to fix the cogwheel in place, making the lever usable, and heading back up to the room, you pull down each lever, causing Alexander to talk to you again, saying he can't let him proceed any farther. Ignoring him, you continue on and find that the levers open the gates to the choir and the transept. You decide to head to the transept first and come across a huge room with metal cages hanging from the ceilings. You find that there are three rooms with all of them leading to some kind of torture chamber. You end up finding three shards from exploring each of these chambers, and through flashbacks and notes you find out Alexander and Daniel tortured prisoners to collect their energy. After, they would give the prisoners amnesia drink that would cause them to forget everything that had happened during the torture. They would then reuse the prisoner again to torture them, continuing the process of gaining more energy from them. 
I really love how dark and grim it feels walking around the transept. You can just feel all the pain and anguish resonating from these rooms. The atmosphere is well done and is accomplished by amazing voice acting, good sound design, and the well-crafted environment. You can really feel the pain and suffering. Back to the game, after you find the shards, you head up the long spiral staircase that leads to Alexander's office. In this room, you find String and a note by Alexander going into horrific detail how to get the most amount of fear and torture from these individuals to collect Vitae, the energy Alexander needs. In one of the drawers, you find a scroll made by Alexander talking about how there is no way to redeem himself to the people in this world. He continues saying that he had to because it was the only way to remove himself from this land and return home. I really love this whole story plot of Alexander being some kind of being from another world, and that the only way to go back is through doing horrible acts upon the living on this planet he is stuck on. Personally, I think it's one of the most important nodes you come across in the game because it explains a lot on why he wanted Dano to come. He needed the orb to use its power to open the gate home, but in order for him to do so, he had to gain more energy, which you find out is through inflicting pain and suffering among human beings. It's an amazing story that fits the whole mood of this game, which is anguish, despair, and pain. Back to the game, after you collect all the shards from the transept, you head over to the choir. And on your way to the choir, you find a room that has another scroll made by Alexander, describing how he has been on this planet for many years, going on explaining that he doesn't age by time, but by anguish. In this room, you also find the note that depicts how to make a potion for Agrippa. You continue on to the quiet entrance and come across a note in a room where you find out Denu had done the ritual and killed the man. You also realize he seems to be losing it when he continues shouting out, Take the man, cut the lines, cut the flesh, watch the blood spill, let it come. After reading the note, you get a quick flashback of Daniel telling Alexander there isn't much time and that he'll do whatever it takes. With the flashback ending, you continue on into the choir, heading into the main hall. And in this main hall, you find it covered in red mist and start hearing Alexander speaking to you again. Alexander goes on explaining that none of this would have happened if he just accepted his fate to the orb when he first discovered it and that revenge isn't the answer. You carry on ignoring Alexander and come across three rooms used for torture. In these rooms, you find the last three shards to make the orb. And while going to these rooms, he also had to dodge the monsters scouting the area. After you gather the shards, you tell Agrippa about the note you found for the potion he needs. He tells you to create the potion so you can cut off his head and take it to the gate Alexander's opening, which is the door to another world. After this, you could then take your revenge on Alexander. You head on towards the sanctum, but suddenly you get attacked by tons of monsters causing you to black out. You wake up finding yourself in a cell. And Alexander speaks to you about how you took the amnesia drink, which explains why you aren't acting your normal self. He decides to keep you in the cell till his work is done. Now during this part of the game, there is a secret bad ending. If you aren't able to escape the cell in time, you get consumed by the shadow, killing you, causing the game to end. But if you make it out, the game continues on. You escape by breaking the top bar of the cell and jumping through the opening. And after getting out, you have to find a key to open the door to escape the prison room. You end up finding the key in some old pipes and use a bucket of water to flush out the key. Once you pick it up, you hear a loud thud and realize the shadow is following you, trying to kill you. This forces you to run as fast as you can, just barely making it out alive. This chase sequence has a lot of similarities to when you were being hunted by the water monster at the beginning of the game. One thing that made this chase nerve wracking was while running away from the shadow, you come across a door that is blocked by wood and boulders. You end up having to pull them out of the way, which takes some time. But while you're doing this, you can hear the shadow getting closer to you, causing you to panic because you know if you don't unblock the door in time, you're dead. It's another example of how this game uses the game mechanics to enhance the chase sequences and really heightens the panic within the player. Once you make it through the door, you find yourself back at the top of the staircase where the levers were. In this room, you come across a note which takes you back in time when Daniel and Alexander kidnap people from their homes. During this kidnap, Daniel was the one who went in and took the children. The reason I did all this was to have enough prisoners for the ritual. After the flashback, you head back downstairs, but realize the shadow is now covering everything, catching up to you. You continue on and find that the laboratory room is now open. Using the ingredients you got from exploring, you make the potion using the machines in the laboratory. After making it, you go back to Agrippa and feed him the potion and cut off his head. 
Once you pick up Agrippa's head, you make your way to the inner sanctum, but find out you need to put the orb together and place it on the altar. You also find out that you need to somehow get rid of the electrical barrier. Looking around some more, you find a room that has tar which can be used to put the shards together into an orb. Along with this, you also find a note of Daniel having an existential crisis realizing he has become a murderer, killing innocent people to save his own life. This is probably why Daniel drank the amnesia potion. He couldn't deal with what he had done, and didn't have the strength to fix his own problem. So he decided to use the amnesia drink to wipe the pain away and have his future self go and finish what he couldn't. After reading the note, you find a machine that is running the electrical barrier. To stop it, you clock the machine using a rock, causing it to break. Now that the barrier is gone, you head back and glue the pieces of the orb to the altar and make a mad dash into the inner sanctum because you hear a monster chasing you closely behind. Finally making it through, you come across a stairway which leads you to a lever that opens doors to two rooms where you must give some of your blood in order to open the final door to the inner sanctum. While doing this, you come across a note written by Daniel describing how he's been manipulated by Alexander and has found out that he plans to leave Daniel to fend the shadow for himself. Daniel goes on that he will kill Alexander because he made him a murderer. After unlocking the door, you find Alexander seeming to begin the opening of the gate to the other world. This is when you have multiple choices and each one affects the ending of the game. The first which I would consider the revenge ending, if you put Agrippa's head into the portal, you end up ruining Alexander's plan, killing him and you as well by the shadow. The screen goes black and you see some blue lights. You hear Agrippa seemingly talking to someone, telling this person that Daniel deserves much better and that they should help Daniel. Agrippa's last words were, Daniel, it'll be alright. The next ending, if you don't do anything at all and allow Alexander to go through the portal, Daniel ends up getting brutally killed by the shadow. The last ending and probably the best ending in the game is if you knock over the pillars, it ruins the opening of the portal causing Alexander to be killed. But with you finally being able to walk freely outside the castle. There's no denying the things I've done, but I have paid my tribute. I gave them that awful man. I did the right thing. As you can see, this game is truly a masterpiece in its storytelling and atmosphere. There are so many great things about this horrifying game. It has game mechanics that complement the gameplay and heighten the fear in the player. The story is cleverly used to not only farther drive fear within you, but also becomes beneficial to completing the game. The sound design and voice acting is grim and dark and helps set the mood throughout the whole game. The monsters are cleverly used at the right moments to build up tension and are well designed with each monster having different features and characteristics. There are so many small details in this game that makes it feel complete. Like I love how the castle feels alive with corridors twisting and bending, and the use of creaking and roaring sounds coming from the castle's structure. I love that people you hear talking, screaming, or crying while you're playing the game represents the awful memories Daniel has seeping into his consciousness. It's just so clever. The reason this game works so well and became one of the most innovative horror games out there is because fictional games knew this formula would work. They didn't test the waters, they fully dived into this new horror concept and sticked with it through the whole development. It's because of this, the game feels well made and thought out with the innovation in mind. Sometimes when games try to do something different, they don't go all the way and fear of players disliking it. So most game companies end up playing it safe and test the waters instead. But not frictional games, you can tell they put their all into this idea and in the end, it has led to success. A new era of horror games. And that brings us to the aftermath of Amnesia's release. After its release, some YouTubers decided to make a Let's Play series over the game. You may know some of these YouTubers for how huge and successful they are today. Alright ladies and gentlemen, my name is Peppa. And I can't believe I'm doing this. All right, hello everybody. This is Markiplier here with my brand new Let's Play of Amnesia The Dark Descent. Markiplier made his first series of videos over Amnesia and garnered a lot of attention, causing him to gain more subs and views over his channel. Same for PewDiePie who made a series of videos as well over the game, gaining the same amount of recognition. This explosion in people's interest to watch people do Let's Plays blew up and gave Amnesia more exposure to other people that would be interested in the game. 
Amnesia started inspiring people, and because of this, horror games started moving towards Amnesia's horror formula for how successful it was. Soon enough, games like Outlast, Alien Isolation, Slender the Eight Pages, and many more started appearing being inspired by the game that started it all, Amnesia. Today, most horror games follow the footsteps of Amnesia's innovation and utilize the same elements of what made it so good. It's amazing seeing just how huge of an impact Amnesia has had in the horror fanbase, to the amount of people it has inspired, all the way to showing developers a new way to create horror games. Along with this, it's really cool knowing that Amnesia was part of why Let's Plays started gaining in popularity, and was a game that started many YouTubers' careers back in the day. Overall, this game holds a special place in my heart for when it comes to horror in general. It has left a huge mark on what horror games are today, and still continues to inspire more people every day. With that said, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos like this one. Also, don't be afraid to leave a comment about how Amnesia may or may not have inspired you. I'd love to hear other people's views over this topic. With that said, thanks for watching, and see you next time.